Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick and Intercom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with a couple of Intel pieces of news, the first one being the i7-8565U, which is a mobile part of the Whiskey Lake variety. But this one is very impressive indeed, as it has a single core turbo speed of up to 4.6 gigahertz, which is several hundred megahertz higher than uh, previous parts. And it is built on Intel's 14NM++ process. So let's go through the specifications and the leaked benchmarks, which have appeared in Geekbench, thanks to multiple entries, most likely all from Lenovo. And they seem to be getting around of late of leaking lots of stuff, don't they? So these benchmarks have popped up in Geekbench thanks to a several entries from a Lenovo laptop, the Lenovo SB50. So what about the specifications and performance then? Well, let's start out with the performance. We have a single core score of 5,445 and a multi-core score of 15,895. There are, of course, different entries which uh, achieve different results, but still the results are fairly consistent, which is obviously good news. And in terms of the specifications, four core, eight threads, two gigahertz on the base frequency. But as I mentioned, the maximum frequency, which is presumably just a single core, is 4.6 gigahertz. The cache uh, layout is pretty much what you'd expect. Level three cache is eight megabytes times one. Level two cache is 256 kilobytes per core. So obviously 256K times four. And finally, you've got level one and level uh, level 1 instruction and level 1 data cache, which is 32 kilobytes each for each core. You might say, well, the multi-core score isn't quite as high as you would expect given the sheer performance of the single core. So what's going on there? Most likely there's a couple of options. The first is that it's not uh, boosting very high when all cores are active or uh, it's possible that it could be firmly limited, power limited, or something else going on there. So it might not necessarily be a factor of the chip itself, but it could also be just the environment of the laptop that it's running in. Either way, we'll know more when the chip is finally released, along with the various products that it will be contained within. Speaking of Intel, let's move over to another piece of Intel news, and this one concerns their discrete GPUs. AMD lost a couple of key personnel with both Chris Hook and Raj Akhadori, migrating from AMD to Intel. And of course, they are working on discrete GPUs at the company. The first one to be launched is the uh, Arctic Sound GPU, and then later on we'll see Jupiter Sound. But rather interestingly, a analyst by the name of Kevin Crewell on Twitter has said that I doubt Intel will make much progress with gamers. It's hard enough to getting AMD and Nvidia fans to switch between red team and green team. Why would they switch to blue team? I think it's going to be an uphill battle for uh, G chip, which is in reference to Chris Hook and Raja on the edge, obviously Raja Kodori. Bundling is likely a strategy like Intel did with the i740. Raja Kodori actually responded to this and he said, I can't recall a single downhill battle we fought in 21 years. End quote. I have two mindsets when it comes to my thoughts on this. The first is that people do get very invested in a particular ecosystem. After all, let's say that you're the owner of a decent 1440p G-Sync monitor. Even if AMD or Intel were to release a graphics chip tomorrow which is better than what you've currently got let's say it's even better than Turing let's say it's 20% faster for sake of argument at a similar price point you might say well okay that's great but then I lose out on the g-syncness of my current monitor and then that's something else I have to take into consideration and of course the same thing could be said if you've got a free sync monitor you you get where I'm going with this the bottom line is people do get invested in that and you've also got to take into consideration people's uh, familiarity with the drivers, the control panel, the feature set of particular GPUs. For example, you've got GeForce Experience or Relive. You might prefer one or the other, or you just might be more familiar with one or the other. Then you've got other aspects as well, like NVIDIA's GameWorks or whatever that you know is bundled with your GPU and you're used to. That is something that you're going to be aware of. But with that said, people are also smart when it comes to their money, generally speaking. It's like, if you're buying a new PC upgrade, especially if you're just going from the ground up, and let's face it, a lot of folks now, you can make a good argument that 
Honestly, if you've got a fairly decent GPU, you might just wait, as, or perhaps you'll buy Turing now, just for sake of argument, and then wait until 2020 to see what the next generation of GPUs might be like. They're not going to be doing this without knowledge that AMD and Nvidia are going to want to keep their customers, right? That's pretty obvious. Now, my personal opinion is that Intel have great software engineers, they've got great chip designers, they know what gamers will want. And of course, it's not just being designed with gamers in mind as well. You've also got the data center and other such usage scenarios. My personal opinion is that I do believe that Intel will be very aggressive of mirroring or at the very least offering similar alternatives to what AMD and Intel do offer with their particular software. So then it goes, it's going to come down to pricing and marketing and possibly, yes, bundling and deals that they can get with games developers and other things as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if we do see Intel start playing a little dirty. I mean, after all, Nvidia have, AMD have, and there's probably going to be AMD pushing to have their games, uh, sorry, their uh, certain games optimized with their GPUs and Nvidia doing the same and I wouldn't be surprised if Intel yes do the same and we've already seen them pushing towards Vulcan it's going to be very interesting I think in 2020 particularly when you consider that yes at that point ray tracing I wouldn't it's going to it's not going to be normal by any stretch of the imagination but the next generation of consoles will be here presumably we're going to have Nvidia's RTX technology and at least semi full swing we're going to have ray tracing probably being pushed with DirectX 12 and hopefully the last vestiges of any uh, DirectX 11 releases will have long gone by then, at least I'm hoping. In other words, it's going to be a very curious time in the market over the next couple of years to see the transition. And of course, it's going to be curious to see what both Nvidia and AMD are going to swing at um, Intel with. And a lot of people will blame Raja Kodori with Vega, but from what we've learned about Vega and the fact that Raja didn't have a full team to work on Vega, and that's putting it mildly, and the fact that they were working on budgetary constraints as well, I'm almost inclined to actually take a lot of the blame away from Raja Kodori. So at least in my opinion, I'm going to be curious to see what happens with Intel. And I do think that they are a juggernaut. So let's just see how it goes. So on to Microsoft, specifically on a next generation operating system. And this has been leaked, I suppose is a very generous way of putting it, by Synaptics as well as AMD, who have announced joint collaboration and are working with Microsoft to provide a secure environment with a next generation Windows ecosystem. So let's first of all go through the statements and then we can kind of go through some conjecture. That makes some sense, right? The security system will be for a commercial, an enterprise and consumer notebook PCs based on the next generation AMD Ryzen mobile platform, as well as Microsoft's next generation operating system. Also, Synaptics mentions that Microsoft has a forthcoming biometric security OS, including Windows Hello. I'll put the full quotes as well from AMD and Synaptics on the screen, but there are a couple of things that we can start to dissect here. The first is that Next generation operating system is very, it's a very broad statement. It could mean that it could just simply be an update to Windows 10, right? We've seen multiple updates for Windows 10 and they have very much changed the look and the feel and the functionality of the OS. So we could be seeing something like that or perhaps a tweaked version of Windows 10 specifically for those environments. Which makes sense. One of the criticisms often levered at Microsoft is that well, yeah, your operating system isn't as secure. The problem is, though, security, it's kind of weird. Like, when Windows Vista come up uh, into the fray back in the day, a common complaint about Vista was actually UAC, which, to me, was bizarre. Like, people were actually complaining about that and disliking the fact that security prompt would come up and all of this stuff because they said that it was intrusive and annoying and users didn't understand what they were doing. And it, Microsoft have this really weird line that they have to walk where they have to, yes, be concerned about people's details and security, but they also need to be aware that, well, that usability and that simplicity is also what's keeping them from losing customers to, let's say, the Mac OS. Furthermore, there is also the possibility that it could have absolutely nothing at all to do with Windows 10. 
We've also been hearing about Polaris. No, we're not talking about the GPUs from AMD here. Instead, we're referring to another operating system from Microsoft. Now, we don't know much about it, and that is actually me being extremely generous. Instead, all we know it's module-based. Modularity in computing does seem to be becoming a thing recently, right? I mean, after all, we're seeing it in the way that chips are being designed, with MCMs becoming increasingly popular over larger monolithic designs. And it's because the computing systems no longer have such rigid constraints. You might have very different needs to me. You might not care about gaming. You might not care about Xbox functionality. You might not care about, uh, let's say, paint and whatever else that's installed. You might just need X, Y, and Z. And the bottom line is, some users don't need the same thing as other users. So modularity, particularly when it comes to hardware itself, could certainly be very important. And one of the things that we're hearing about Polaris from uh, Microsoft is that it will be based upon modularity. Users or OEMs or whomever will be able to tweak and alter this as required. I wouldn't be surprised if this could form, and this is pure conjecture, this is not part of these rumors, but I wouldn't be surprised if a variant of Polaris or something else could actually form the basis of the new Xbox uh, console as well. That's pure conjecture on my part, but it would make sense. It would usher in the new age. There are other questions, of course, and that includes legacies and compatibility. After all, you can't just be like, well, uh, we're just going to break 32-bit compatibility because, well, there are still a lot of 32-bit programs which are either being created right now or that are legacy. And so you can't just break those because you are going to get someone, no doubt, who is still running Office 2007 because they hate the latest versions or they just plum refuse to buy the latest versions or whatever. Or maybe they're using an older version of Photoshop that they bought back in, you know, version 3.0. You get why I'm going with this. So you do need that legacy compatibility of 32-bit operating systems. So we do know some stuff is certainly going to remain almost almost inherently, but modularity could possibly see that if it's a console, for example, it doesn't need legacy compatibility necessarily with 32-bit. It's going to be interesting to see how all of this play plays out over the next several years. Next up, we are going to be tackling Fujitsu because they are working to have mass production of NRAM by 2019. And this is actually extremely exciting. NRAM is a persistent technology, much like X-Point, but has a lot of potential. For a start, it is considerably faster than, let's say, X-Point technology. In fact, the major limiting factor of this memory right now is the interface that it is using, for example, DDR4. And yes, it will technically be compatible with DDR4, but it can also be used for M2 and other such uses as well. It will also operate in a much higher heat envelope than traditional memory. How much higher? Well, it can go up to about 800 degrees. Now, yes, that's not necessarily something that you're probably going to need to concern yourself in the average consumer rig. Insert Pentium 4 jokes here. But it may be useful for, let's say, if you were to send this thing to a different planet, or if you were to, let's say, use it for military purposes or in automotive uses, uh, anything along those lines, and you can start to see the applications of heat-resistant memory. And here's the other thing, it is incredibly resilient, with Nantira's NRAM actually running up to one trillion cycles in testing. And they were like, okay, well, it's still running. Um, what do we do? Do we just keep going? And they just have said at the moment there's no up limit to how much they feel that this memory can be used. So in other words, it is yet to be determined the limitations of this RAM. That's insane. So the manufacturing process is pretty simple. It is a thin layer of carbon nanotubes which are spin coated on a normal wafer and then they are uh, connected between two interconnects. Um, and what's even better is that this is bit addressable. Because it's bit addressable, not only is performance higher, but also power consumption is lower. And that really is the crux of the matter here. Power consumption is lower. The capacity is higher. It has better ability to work in more extreme environments and is more durable. 
So overall, it is very impressive. So what about performance then? Well, the material itself can operate within about one picosecond. A picosecond, by the way, is one trillionth of a second, but the limitations of the DRAM interface is currently limiting this to just 5NS. So obviously that is considerably slower. But this is a technology which will be able to grow in time and should be very impressive as RAM interfaces get faster and faster and faster. In theory, this will be an excellent competitor to TLC and other such technologies, as well as, of course, as I just mentioned, 3DX point, and it is a persistent memory. And honestly, I think it's really cool sounding. We'll have to see just how it evolves over the next several years as normal with these things, but it does have the potential to be an extremely lucrative venture for the companies involved. And furthermore, <laughs> at least in theory, this memory could potentially eventually replace DDR4 or DDR5 or whatever. It'll be really cool to see. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.